that he be on time. It's important to him, it's important to his job, and this was an important job. I mean, he's gonna drive for Mr. Simpson. You know, it's not just me, somebody like that, or somebody that uh, or ordinary average folk. It's important. He wants to do well, and he certainly doesn't want to be late, make Mr. Simpson miss his flight, so he's checking that clock. And at 10.22, he drives up Rockingham, and he's looking at the curbs to see the addresses, because he's never been there before, and he wants to see 360 Rockingham. This is also logical. I mean, what do you do when you're looking for an address? You look at the curbs, and you try to see where it is, and that's what he did. But when he did that, when he did that, he saw no Bronco parked on Rockingham, and he was looking right there at the curb. Do we have the picture? This is People 62A, Your Honor. It kind of looks faded on the... Uh, yeah. Oh, you can see it, right? See that curb area? You can see there's a 360 there. Now, as he was driving up, he said, I could see. I could see the 360 on the curb. Now, if he could see the 360 on the curb and you can see where the Bronco is right there, that big white car, he's not going to miss it. He's going to see it. I don't, if he's driving slowly enough to see the number on the curb and realize that he's hit the defendant's address, then he's obviously paying enough attention to see a big old white car there. And he didn't see it. So we know that at 1022, the Bronco was not on Rockingham. But we know more, because we know at this point, when Alan Park turned the corner onto Ashford, he told you he did not see any Bronco on Ashford either. So as of 1022, that Bronco's gone and the defendant is gone. That's further corroboration for what we told you with the phone calls in the Bronco. He was out in that Bronco on that night. So he indicated that he turned right onto Ashford, he made a U-turn, and he parked across the street from the defendant's home from the Ashford gate side. He got out of his car. Remember, he, sat on, he went and sat on the curb behind the car and had a cigarette, waiting for it to be time to start buzzing for the defendant. And when he got back in his car, he looked at the clock, and he saw that it was 10.39. Now, at 10.39, he decided to check out the other gate, the Rockingham gate, and see if that would be easier to pull into than the Ashford gate. Because remember, he told you he had that stretch limo, kind of hard to maneuver. So, you know, what gate he went in and where he was, this was an important consideration for him. The logistics were not that easy with that car. When he drove down to the Rockingham gate, he told you that he pulled the driver's side window parallel uh, with the driveway so that he could look into the driveway and see whether it would be easier for him to get the stretch limo up that side of the driveway, because of the way it curved. And I, you guys remember, you were there. You saw it's a curving driveway. When he did that, the area where the Bronco was found on the curb, just north of the Rockingham Gate, was well within his field of vision. But he didn't see it. Again, further corroboration. The Bronco was not there. Now, he backed up Rockingham, and he backed all the way up past Ashford, and then made a left back onto Ashford. And at that point, he actually pulled up into the Ashford gate, so that he's, the headlights would be um, almost up against the Ashford gate, I think he indicated. And he told you that he saw a 300ZX, a black one, parked to his left on, the Ashford, on Ashford Street, just to the left or east of the gate. And Cato told you, that's right, that was my car. That was there. And you even see it in some of the photographs that we've shown you uh, during the course of this trial. Now, when he pulled up facing the Ashford Gate, Mr. Park told you that it was 1040, and he looked at his clock. At that point, he turned off his headlights and I left, left the parking lights on, and he got out to push the buzzer at the Ashford Gate. He wanted to let the defendant know that he was there. He pushed the buzzer, he told you, a good two or three times. And he heard the buzzing and the ringing noise as he did that, but he got no answer. He was concerned because the pickup was supposed to be, he told you, for 1045. Starting to get up there now. So he called his boss. 
and he wanted to ask him what he should do. And I have a board that shows Alan Park's uh, cell phone record. And that was a very important cell phone record because that helps us to fix a lot of events that were testified to that otherwise would have been very approximate. With the help of his uh, cell phone record, we have much more definite times, much more precise. All right, Mr. Escobar, if you just briefly show defense counsel. All right, this is People's Exhibit. Pe sorry, Your Honor. People's Exhibit number 149. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hold it up close to you so you can see it. Um, can you all see it? Yeah? Okay. All right. He made the call to his boss at 1043. You can see. We show you when the call begins and when the call ends. Dale St. John was his boss. And he called his pager. <clears throat> After he placed that call, he told you that he got out to ring the intercom a few more times. So now he rang the intercom at 1040, no answer, 1043, no answer. And he said he rang it a few times on each occasion, no answer. He noticed that there were no lights on downstairs and that there was one light on upstairs. He got back in the car and he called his mother and he got his boss's home phone number and called him again at 10.49. And you see that call, we have a lot more calls in here, but at 10.49 he called his boss again and he left a message because he got no answer. Now when he left that message at 10.49 for his boss after he hung up, he got out and tried the buzzer again. Now this is the third time. He's tried to get someone to answer that buzzer at the gate the third time that he rang two or three times. And this third time again, he got no answer. Now, he also testified throughout all these events, getting in and out of the car and buzzing. Um, you guys can sit. I'll come back to it in a minute. I'm going to wear you out. Thank you. <clears throat> He told you also, um, if you recall, that during this time that he was out by the Ashford Gate, he was paying attention to who was there. He was trying to reach the defendant, but he was very focused on whether he could get somebody to answer the buzzer, on whether he could get Dale St. John to call him back. I mean, these were the things that were occupying his mind, care and he was carefully concerned about this because he had to get to the airport. But he was not listening for traffic. He was not listening to hear if a Bronco pulled up, and it wouldn't have been, he told you, it would not have been significant to him if he had heard a car pull up or a car door slam, so what? He's, not, he's thinking, I gotta get somebody to the airport. He's not thinking what cars are driving by, who's here, who's not here. He just wants to get going. He's late, and he's worried about that. So, although it would have been nice if he could have told us that he heard the Bronco pull up on Rockingham when it did, he just wasn't paying attention to that. And so he can't give us any information on that. We know the Bronco did pull up. We know it did because it got there. We know it wasn't there as of 1040, 1039 when he drove down on Rockingham. And it was there later that night. All right, back to Park. Now, after he tried the buzzer at uh, 10, after calling his boss at 1049, uh, he got out. It was when he was actually buzzing at that point. Let me back up for a second. He called his boss at 1049 at home. He got no answer. He went out to the gate and he rang the buzzer again two or three times and got no answer. While he was at the gate that third time, he heard his car phone ringing and he went back into the car. It was his boss calling him. That call came in That last call came in at 10.52. And he indicated, now he told you about the fact that his boss called him. And he told his boss that no one had been home and he'd been ringing for a while. 
and he was very concerned because he was running late. Now, at that time, I asked him, were you seated in your car when you were speaking to your boss? He said, yes. Where were you looking? I was looking through the gate right into the driveway. Well, what is the driveway lighting like? What is it like in there? Well, it's not really very well lit. The play area down in front, I'm going to pull out a diagram of Rockingham in a minute and show you exactly what I mean. It was dark, though. Um, there were very little light. There was a light over the garage, but it gave very little illumination, and it did not light up the south pathway area at all. So he sat in his car talking to his boss, looking straight through the gate and at the driveway. Okay, this is just to get you oriented in case you forgot. It's been a while since we went out and did the uh, walkthrough at Rockingham. So you see the area that says play yard there. And Park indicated that area uh, was very dark. He indicated also, as he was seated in his car at the Ashford Gate, that he could not see the Rockingham Gate from where he was seated. He indicated to you, you see where that line is drawn at the garage? He saw nothing below that line. His field of view was limited to what was in front of that line. And that's because of the lighting that was at the driveway. Now, he, when he told his boss about no one being home and it was running late, his boss said, well, sometimes he does run late. Mr. Simpson does run late. Why don't you check, look at the lighting in the I believe he said the uh, pantry area, because he usually watches TV there. Well, Park checked the area, he looked, and he couldn't see any lighting coming from that area, and he told that to his boss. During this conversation, Alan told you that he saw Cato come out on the side yard where the arrow is pointing, roughly in that area. I think it was a little bit farther back towards the tree, the other tree, that one. And he was holding a flashlight. You recall he told you that? And at the same time, he said almost simultaneously, he saw a person approximately six feet tall, 200 pounds, African American, wearing all dark clothing, walking at a good pace up the driveway. And he told you that he hung up within With the court reporter, please.
Hold on. Hold on. Mr. Hold on. Oh. Hold on. Court reporter's changing paper as well. All right. Thank you, Council. Ms. Clark, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Fairlow to hold off. I wasn't watching his arrow. I want to try and be precise, if I can, about where Mr. Park said he first saw this man. Um, go ahead and use the arrow. I'll tell you where. You can turn it around. All right. I believe it. Now, let me, let me say this, because I know I'm going to forget if I don't say it when I think of it now. If you have any questions about anything that is said by either myself or by the defense during argument as to whether or not it is accurate, you can ask to have the record read back. Court reporters hate me for saying this, but in a, a trial this length, you're probably going to need to have your memory refreshed about something. And it's real important that you not, if, you, if your memory conflicts, if your notes conflict with what we're saying, uh, you, you've got to have that resolved. If you need to have the record read back to have that resolved, then do it. And if you think that something I have said has been a misstatement, believe me, I'm not trying to. I'm trying to be very, very accurate here. But in case everybody makes mistakes, in case I make a mistake, have the record read back. I believe the testimony indicated that he uh, saw this person uh, in approximately where the arrow is. And he saw him walk up the driveway and into the entrance. Now, he hung up within 30 seconds of seeing that which means that, according to the cell phone bill, according to the cell phone bill, the call ended at 10.55 and 12 seconds. Approximately 30 seconds before that is when he saw the man walk into the house. And immediately, immediately as soon as the man walked into the house, the lights started to go on. They went on downstairs. Now, Alan waited in his car, thinking that someone would let him in. But no one did. Now, if you recall, Cato said that he went out, he had gone out to that side yard to investigate the thumping noises. And when he saw the limo driver, he figured that the limo driver was already taken care of and that some, the defendant would buzz him in. So he didn't worry about it. He kept on about his business, and he went down to that south pathway, if you recall, to start looking to see what was going on back there. So Alan got out of his car and buzzed again. And this was now within a minute of seeing the man walk into the house. The lights go on. Within a minute of that, Alan buzzed again. This is the fourth time. This time, he got an answer immediately. And the answer was given to him was by the defendant. The defendant answered and told him he'd overslept, and he'd just gotten out of the shower, and he would be down in a minute. Now, Alan told you that the man who he saw enter the house appeared to be the same size as the defendant and about the same height as, and weight. He would not stretch even one iota to draw the obvious conclusion that the man he saw walking up the driveway was the defendant. Of course it was. There was no one else there that night. It was the defendant. Who else could walk in the door, immediately turn on the lights, and then answer the intercom? I mean, this, this is an easy, reasonable inference to draw. Easy. But what's significant here is that he lied. Why did the defendant lie? Why, when he was just out in the driveway, walking into the house, dressed in all dark clothing, why, when he answered the intercom for Allen Park, did he lie and say, I've overslept, just getting out of the shower? We know it's not true. We know it's not true. Why was it important for him to make Alan Park believe that he'd been at home? And I think we all know the answer to that question. Because he hadn't been at home. Because he'd just come back from Bundy. 
Now let's go back to Cato for a moment. It's concerning those thumps and when they happened. Cato said that he hung up from his call with Rachel pretty quickly after he heard the thumping. He estimated for you two to three minutes. Now, with Alan's cell phone call, Bill, we can be very, very precise about when that was. He indicated that he went out to investigate the noises, hung up with Rachel, went out to investigate two to three minutes after he heard the thumping. Alan told you he saw Cato and the defendant, at a, I'm saying the defendant, he said the man that looked like the defendant, you, un, you understand, I'm talking about what we know based on all of the evidence, that it was him. 10.54, he saw Cato, approximately, because it was at the same time he saw the defendant, and he hung up 30 seconds after seeing him walk in the house and after seeing Cato on the side yard. So at 10.54, Cato was out in the side yard. Hearing the thumping noises two to three minutes before that means that he heard the thumping on his wall at 1051 to 1052. So what we have, about two minutes after the thumping, the defendant was walking up, was walking into his house from the driveway, and Cato out in the side yard. In other words, we have the thumping and Cato walking out and the defendant walking out around at the same time. And the thumping happened very shortly, what is it, within half an hour of the murders. And the defense would have you believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the defendant's appearance on the driveway just two minutes after the thumping on Cato's wall is a coincidence. And the defense would have you believe that the thumping and the appearance of that glove, the defendant's glove, were unrelated events. And the thumps themselves, just think about that. Regardless of where or how they happened, just the fact that they happened shortly after the murders at the defendant's house and just before the defendant walked up his driveway in dark clothing, like the dark blue or black sweat outfit that Cato described, you just put those facts together and you realize what has happened. The defendant came back from Bundy in a hurry. Ron Goldman upset his plans, and things took a little longer than anticipated. He ran back behind the house, that dark, narrow south pathway. You all saw it. You were there in daytime. But imagine how dark it is at night. That dark, narrow south pathway, thinking he could get rid of the glove, the knife, in that dirt area in the back. You recall back behind the guest houses, there's a dirt area. It was just all dirt, not very well tended. But he was in a hurry. He was moving quickly down a dark, narrow pathway, overhung with trees, strewn with leaves. And in his haste, he ran right into that air conditioner that was hanging over that south pathway. And running into that air conditioner caused him to fall against the wall, making the wall of Cato's room shake. You recall that air conditioner, it was hanging low. You had to stoop to get down under it. And if you're in a hurry and you're not looking where you're going, in that dark, narrow pathway, you can see how it can easily happen, how someone in a hurry can do that. And it was just as simple as that. Simple common sense tells you that the thumping, the glove, and the defendant's appearance on the driveway almost immediately thereafter are all part one set of events, all connected in time and space. You don't need science to tell you that. You just need reason and logic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the morning session at this time. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't form any, don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been actually submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1.30. All right.
All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Ms. Clark, are you prepared to proceed? Yes, Your Honor, thank all you. All right, you may resume. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, when we left off, I was talking about the occurrence of the thumping, the gloves appearing, the gloves dropping on the, walk, uh, the uh, south pathway, and the defendant's appearance on the driveway. At, within a couple of minutes of each other. Now, while Alan Park was speaking to the defendant on the intercom at that time, Cato, who realized that, who wasn't worried about Alan being left outside, went over to the south pathway and looked down the gate. Can we get 66D back? Let's put up that diagram again so you can orient yourself, because it's hard just talking about this in the abstract. Okay, can we back out just a little bit more? A little bit more? There we go. And the south pathway, if you recall, is at the bottommost edge below where that area marked garage is, you might recall. And he said that he went over to that area, looked down there, went through the first gate, went as far as the second gate, but that flashlight was very dim. And he was worried, and he was scared, and he didn't want to go any farther. So he looked down there, but it was dark, and he didn't want to go any farther. He said that he could not see the portion of the pathway that was right outside the wall of his room where he'd heard the thumping. It was too dark. And he came back out without going actually any farther on the pathway. When he came back out, he realized that Alan Park was still waiting outside the gate. Now, this is after he'd, Alan had spoken to the defendant on the intercom. And when he realized that the defendant had not yet buzzed Alan in, he went and he let him in. Now, let me ask you this. Why didn't the defendant let Alan Park drive in to the driveway? Why leave him sitting out there at the gate? Why make him wait outside? Because the defendant was frazzled, ladies and gentlemen. He was hurried, and he needed to buy some time. Time to wash himself up, wash off the blood, change the clothes, and to compose himself to appear normal, to appear calm, business as usual. So he bought himself that time, and he did not let Alan in. And when he came down, when the defendant came downstairs, he had changed clothes, no longer the dark clothing that Cato had described him in earlier that evening. He was wearing stonewashed denim jeans, denim shirt, and carrying a garment bag. You remember that Louis Vuitton garment bag that's here in evidence. Allen estimated that the defendant came downstairs dressed like that, carrying the garment bag about five to six minutes after he spoke to him on the intercom. I think Allen Park's words were a good five minutes. Could have been longer. This was an estimate by him. But before the defendant actually came down, Cato went to let Allen Park in the gate, let him in, and he immediately told Allen about the thumping noises he had heard. He asked him, had, did you feel an earthquake? The same thing he asked Rachel Ferrara, if you recall. She told him she hadn't. Alan said the same thing. I didn't feel an earthquake. Now, Cato was clearly upset, clearly distracted and upset by that thumping noise he had heard. In fact, as you recall, he went to check that south pathway twice, once before he let Alan in, and then a second time after he let Alan in, because he had the conversation with Alan Park, asked him about the earthquake, if he had felt it, told him about the thumping noises, I think said he told him he thought, or he was thinking anyway, that it might have been a prowler. And after he let Alan in, he felt safer, and he went back to check the south pathway again, we, again with that dim flashlight, and didn't get any farther than he did the last time, and still wasn't able to see as far as the area of where his room was, and it was still very dark back there, and he gave up. But so Cato was concerned enough to check that south pathway twice, talk to his girlfriend Rachel about it, saying, call the police if you don't hear from me. Talk to Alan Park about it. And he talked to the defendant about it. The defendant came downstairs, and he started talking to him. Did you hear that? Did, did you feel an earthquake? I'm really worried. I, felt, I heard this thumping on my wall. I'm really concerned about this. He's really worried about it. And what does the defendant do? The defendant never went out to the south pathway to check what might have gone on back there, to check for the sound of the so source of the thumping. 
The defendant never called West Tech Security, nor did he ever tell Cato to call West Tech Security. The defendant never called the police, nor did he tell Cato to call the police. In fact, he left without even setting the alarm and had to call Cato from the airport to tell him to set the alarm, something he had never done before. Now, having heard about the thumping noises from Cato, hearing Cato's concern about it, how Cato was trying to figure out why that happened or what was the source of it, and being very worried about it, knowing that he was going out of town, his daughter Arnell staying on the property and would be there alone with Cato, he did nothing to check on the source of the thumping. He did none of the things you'd expect someone to do under those circumstances. That is, someone who didn't already know what caused the thumping. But you see, he did. He knew. So of course, he was unconcerned. He knew it was no prowler. Certainly, we knew it's no earthquake. Because he knew the thumps were caused by him bumping into the wall. And so he didn't have to be worried that Arnell was going to be in danger, or even Cato in danger, or his home in danger, because it was not a question for him. It was something he knew about. And he acted like someone who already knew what the source of those sounds were, unconcerned. Now back to loading up the car. Alan and Cato described how they loaded up all the bags, all except one. You may recall that there was testimony about a small dark bag that was on the edge of the driveway by the Bentley. And Cato, as they were loading up the bags, offered to go and get that bag for him. I'll go get that for you. The defendant said, no, 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 I'll get it. And the testimony was that all of the bags were loaded by either Cato or Alan Park, except for that one. And after the defendant walked towards it, after saying, no, I'll get it, after he walked towards it, no one ever saw that little black dark bag again. Nor have we ever found the knife the defendant used, nor have we ever found the clothes that he wore during the murder, nor have we ever found the shoes that he wore during the murder. And it's so typical. It's so common. They get rid of the murder weapon, they think that's it. Can't get me. Home free. But you see, as you've seen, it's not that easy. Evidence was left behind. So we don't need the murder weapon because we have much, much more proof than that. Now, while they were loading the bags, Alan, as I told you before, saw the defendant go out to the Rockingham Gate where, he saw, where we saw that the Bronco was parked. Now, we, I referred to this earlier that he, the defendant told uh, Dr. Bodden that he'd cut his hand while getting the cell phone out of the Bronco. I'm going to show you why that does not explain all of his blood in that car. And I'm going to show you that he did not receive that cut on his finger from the cell phone. Now, the defendant stood in the foyer talking to Cato for a few moments. Can we get a photograph of that? And that's when he dripped blood. You see the little marker in that photograph. But after he came downstairs, the, de the testimony went, he never went upstairs. Cato stood with him. Cato was talking to him. Cato went inside the foyer with him, went towards the kitchen at one point looking for a flashlight, you may recall, because Cato was asking the defendant for a better flashlight to go and look down that south pathway. Cato was standing by him, but the defendant was moving around the cars, getting things loaded up. But no one ever testified that he went back upstairs. And I think that it was Cato's test. I think Cato only testified to uh, going into the house with the defendant once, and that was to get the flashlight. And they had also a conversation at that time about setting the alarm when Cato said, I don't want to set the alarm. I don't want the responsibility. I don't know the code. And the defendant said at that time, OK, I'll set it. And then he forgot and called her from the airport. <clears throat> Now, Alan Park indicated, I think, that he saw the defendant go in and out of the house a couple of times, but he never brought any more bags out. He only brought one bag out with him, and that was the garment bag as he came downstairs the first time. That was the only time he saw him bring a bag out. 
But Alan Park was busy loading the limo, and he was not watching the defendant carefully. Cato was hanging by the defendant. Cato was asking him, talking to him about the thumping, and he was trying to get his attention about something that he was very concerned about, because he was going to be left on that property alone with whatever caused that thumping noise. Cato didn't know. So he was talking to the defendant. He was asking for the flashlight, and he was talking to him about setting the alarm. And so Cato was the one who was more carefully tracking where the defendant was going. And Cato talked to, them, talked to him about what I told you, the flashlight and the alarm. Now, the defendant left. And when he left, as you know, he didn't set the alarm. While he was in the limousine, he asked the limousine driver to turn on the air conditioning. He complained repeatedly of being very hot. He rolled the windows down. Boy, it's hot. Boy, it's hot. You have the weather report. And he, you'll, it'll indicate to you it was a cool night. The defendant was kept complaining about being hot. Man, I'm hot. Rolled down the windows. Turned on the air conditioning. I asked Alan Park, were you hot that night? No. I asked Cato, were you hot that night? No. It was a cool night. Now, I said I'd show you that the defendant did not get that big cut on his middle finger from that cell phone when he went to get it from the Bronco. Let me show you something. You recall the testimony that blood was collected from the bathroom upstairs that's just off the defendant's bedroom. And the blood is found very, is found basically in between the sink and the shower in the defendant's bathroom. The defendant was bleeding in his bathroom when he was cleaning and changing his clothes, obviously. That was before he went down to the limo, ladies and gentlemen, before he ever went to the Bronco. He already had that cut by the time he got downstairs. He got it long before he went out to that Bronco to get that cell phone. So since we know he was bleeding upstairs in his own bathroom, and before he went down to the limo, how come there weren't any blood stains on the staircase? Obviously, he didn't fly. And just as obviously, he also bled downstairs. I show you that foyer picture. You've seen that quite a number of times with the blood spots on the floor. So he left blood downstairs as well. There are two possible reasons. We didn't see photographs of blood spots on the staircase. Number one, they were there and they were missed. Seems doubtful because it's a light carpet, light color carpet. Blood should show, but it's possible. Or two, the cut temporarily stopped bleeding. As you may remember, Dr. Heisinger testified that a uh, cut will bleed, clot up, re-bleed, and I'm sure that wasn't news to you. I mean, that's life experience that's common to all of us. You have cut yourself, you'll bleed for a while, and then maybe your hand will be still, and then you'll re-bleed if you exercise it or you rub it against something, you irritate it somehow. But in any case, by the time the defendant got downstairs with the garment bag and started loading up the limo, the cut was temporarily sealed. Now here's the interesting thing about the blood trail on his driveway and the blood in the foyer. When you take into account the blood in the bathroom, doesn't it make sense that he actually reopened the cut while he was moving around getting ready to go? You know you have the blood in the bathroom before he gets down to the limo. So he was already bleeding. You know that you don't have blood spots in between the bathroom and the foyer. So at some point, the bleeding stopped before he left his bedroom. But you do know that you have more blood downstairs. You have blood leading out to the Bronco. Now, Alan Park told you that he saw the defendant go out toward the Rockingham Gate as they were preparing to leave. And you know that the defendant told Dr. Bodden that he went out to the Bronco to get his cell phone from the car. Now, although we don't know for a fact based on photographs that he certainly did not receive that cut on some razor sharp cell phone, it certainly does make sense that when he went out to get the phone, he opened the door to the Bronco and his knuckle grazed the well of the door handle, reopening the cut. You gotta have the Bronco door. You see where that, where the spot is, and then Dennis Fung is holding up the number one. You see that little speck there? 
because picture yourself at the door at the car, okay, and you're up to the driver's door. What hand do you use to open the door? Your left. Especially one like that, where you have to push the button in to open the door, using his left hand. In which case, this middle knuckle is going to graze that door. In which case, a cut that has just temporarily sealed seconds or maybe minutes earlier is going to get irritated and re-bleed. Now, this is just common sense, but when you open a car door, obviously, you need to use the handle. When you close a car door, you don't. How do you close a car door? Slam. Very simple. So by the time he opened the door, before he reached in and got the cell phone, that cut was bleeding again. You have him bleeding before he comes down to the limo up in his bathroom. You have him going down to the Bronco and opening the door. But either way you look at it, he's already bleeding before he gets the cell phone. And that's shown to you by photographs. Now consider this possibility. He opened the car door, grazing his knuckle on that door, reopening the cut, and after getting the cell phone out, walks back up the driveway, dripping blood, walks into the foyer, talks to Cato about getting a flashlight that's better or stronger than the one he's got, talks to him about setting the alarm, and while he's talking to him, he's standing in the foyer. All right, he's standing in that foyer. Can we get the uh, close-up? All right, now you see those two drops down to the uh, left of the number 12? It's kind of faint on this picture. You're gonna have the pictures back in the jury room and, and I think they'll be better and clearer for you than this is. Those are big drops. Those are big blood drops, folks. Not the kind you see from that little slice that Dr. Bodden showed you on the defendant's finger. Now, we, we've, all, we've all been living in this world for a while, and you know that when you get big drops of blood, that's from a big cut. You're not gonna cut yourself on little, get a little slice, like almost looking like a small slice on the inside of that finger, and drip blood like that. It just makes, this is common sense stuff. It's just very logical. Those drops came from a big cut, and we're talking about this cut on the middle finger. Now, did the, defendants notice, did the defendant notice at that point that he was bleeding? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe he did. Put something small on it, get ready to go, let's go. But in the rush of getting ready to leave, Cato, who's worried about a burglar back there, Alan Park, who's worried about getting to the airport on time, no one's paying attention to Mr. Simpson's hands. The fingers, his finger is not the foremost thing that they're worried about here. Now, about the blood on the outside of the car door, I want to make one thing clear. I'm not saying that the blood could only have gotten on the well of that door handle Excuse at Rockingham. Me, Forgive me for interrupting you. Let me see. Counselor, the sidebar with the court reporter, please.
All right. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you to step back into the uh, jury room for just a moment. All right, the record to reflect that the jury has withdrawn from the courtroom. Uh, counsel, as I mentioned to you at sidebar, the reason that I interrupted Ms. Clark, and Ms. Clark, forgive me for the interruption, but while I was uh, taking my notes here on your argument, I noticed that the television camera panned along the uh, defense counsel uh, uh, table, and Mr. Cochran did a close-up of your client taking notes. And it's not appropriate for the television camera to be uh, going along sidebar close enough that one can see what people are writing in their notes, and that's not appropriate. And I thought it would, would not be necessary to tell the television coverage that that's not appropriate, uh, but apparently it's necessary to tell them that it's not appropriate. And it's a uh, very flagrant violation and intrusion into the attorney-client privilege and I'm inclined to terminate the coverage at this time. All right. So, uh, Mr. Bancroft, I'm going to direct you to uh, turn the camera to the seal, and the uh, television coverage is terminated. All right, Deputy uh, Trower, let's have the jurors, please. seated and let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel uh, ladies and gentlemen my apologies to you for those interruptions my apologies to miss Clark for having interrupted her train of thought there uh, a couple of things happened that I needed to deal with immediately and I apologize to you for the disruption and the thought process uh, we will go through at this point until five o'clock and then we'll take our uh, uh, mid afternoon recess and however, I realize that since we're having extended hours, you, one or two of you may have, need, have a need for a comfort break. So if you do, just raise your hand, get the bailiff's attention, and we'll take a quick uh, five or ten minute break if you need to uh, during the longer hours. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon. 
Okay. So now we've talked about uh, conduct, we've talked about opportunity and timing. Let's talk about the physical evidence. I'm not going to do it in the detail. You've already heard it, heaven forbid. But although you've already seen, with the opportunity evidence, with the conduct evidence, we already have evidence to show you that the defendant did commit these murders without even really getting into the physical evidence. And once you see the vast array of physical evidence, you can see that there's virtually an ocean of evidence to prove that this defendant committed these murders. What all of it does, all of this evidence, is it links the defendant to the victims and the crime scene at Bundy. Now, the defense has gone to great lengths to try and to show that he, they could discredit this evidence, um, and the lengths that they have included have been some of the most bizarre and far-fetched notions I think I have ever heard. They've hinted that blood was planted. They've tried to create the impression that multiple other blood stains were contaminated and that somehow all the contamination only occurred where it would consistently prove the defendant was guilty. So now the little amplicons, the little DNA, they're co-conspirators too because they know they've got to rush to only the places where you can attribute the blood to the murderer. When you think about that, just think about that one point logically, okay? Obviously, it's common sense. If contamination is going on, you're going to see it going on all over the place. As a matter of fact, if what they're saying is true with this aerosol effect flying DNA all over the place, then Mr. Simpson's blood type ought to be showing up in other cases. Somewhere, you know, somewhere out uh, or down in another department in a rape case, Mr. Simpson's type should be showing up because it's everywhere. Or even just to confine it to this case. Talk about that. How come if the argument is that his blood is flying all over the place, DNA is flying all over the place, why didn't we find his blood type showing up where it obviously shouldn't be? What I mean is this. They took samples from the pool of blood by Nicole's body. They took samples of blood that was near Ron Goldman's body. Obviously, the blood came from them because they were lying there. And then, of course, you know you have the blood drops leading away from the crime scene. That had to be left by the killer. There, there's no question about that. That was left by the killer because they're next to the bloody shoe prints. So you know. Why is it that the sample of blood they took from her pool of blood didn't come up with the defendant's blood type? If the defendant's blood type DNA is flying all over the place, it's flying all over the place. Then it ought to be all over the place. Why isn't it in the pool of blood sample that was taken from Nicole Brown? Why isn't it in the pool of the blood sample that was taken from near Ron Goldman's body? Logic, common sense. It ought to be there. The DNA, the amplicons, those little things, they don't know where to go. They, they, they don't, they're not guided. Contamination is a random thing. It happens willy-nilly. And what you have here is they're trying to get you to believe that only the killer's blood was contaminated and it was consistently contaminated with only the defendant's blood type. Does this make any sense to you? What you ought to have, if you have contamination, if you've got a problem here, is that some of the blood drops come back to the defendant and some don't. They come back to the real killer. That's what you ought to get because it can't be this consistent. If you had one blood drop in this case, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you, you might be concerned with all of these possibilities they've raised, but you have so many. You have so many. You've got five blood drops leading away from the bodies of the victims out to the driveway, and you've got the blood on the rear gate. And I, you know, that, that's the other part of, uh, of, their, uh, of their scenario that makes no sense, no sense. You have all these police officers that were there on June the 13th. Officer Risky saying his partner, young rookie named Officer Terrazas, shined his light on the rear gate to show him the blood on the rear gate. You have Officer Risky seeing the blood on the rear gate. You have Officer Rossi seeing the blood on the rear gate. You have Detective Phillips seeing the blood on the rear gate. All of it early on. Dennis Fung, whom you can see, is not the model of efficiency, forgot to collect it. And from this we get a theory that seems to, they seem to imply that the blood was planted. Why do they say that? Now, first of all, I want to hear Mr. Cochran actually stand up in front of you and tell you he believes the blood was planted. I want to hear that. Because that is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. When you think about that, think, what evidence have you been given to show you how? 
that blood was planted, to show you when that blood was planted, to show you who planted that blood. Now, the reason that they have to come up with this story about contamination and planting, and I want to hear if they really, really do that, say that to you, is because they can't get around the result. You recall Dr. Gerdes testified for the defense, and he said that the DNA testing that, was allowed, that allowed for RFLP, the most powerful of the techniques of DNA, was, uh, was successful on the rear gate because that blood had higher molecular weight DNA. From the fact that you have higher molecular weight DNA on blood collected uh, later, July 3rd, they want you to infer that somehow it was planted. But they're inconsistent because if you remember, now, now if you plant the blood, aren't you going to plant it close to the time you collect it? What are you going to do? Plant it and hope somebody finds it later? You, you plant it when you expect someone to find it, right? When they have the EDTA going on, you have all these cross-examination questions about EDTA breaking down due to sunlight exposure. There's no proof that that happens, by the way, as you could tell. And they did no test to prove that that happens, by the way. Would be nice if they want to prove that. Do a little testing. You've got the expert right there. Why didn't he do any tests, by the way? But he didn't do any, OK? So they're asking him about EDTA breaking down in the sunlight, trying to infer that it was there for three weeks, that the blood was there. If it's there for three weeks, it wasn't planted, folks. It was there on the night of the murder. This is what I mean by inconsistent, illogical. This makes no sense. If you're going to say that the blood was planted, then you're going to say that it was planted at or near the time of collection, in which case the EDTA would not break down, in which case the EDTA should be intact, in which case you should see the kind of high, smooth arc that the graphs showed you from the reference tubes, instead of the jagged noise that you actually saw. And they brought in Dr. Readers to try and tell you that that jagged noise looks just like that high arc, which is ridiculous which is insulting to your intelligence. But the reason that they have to say this, defying logic, defying common sense, is because, ladies and gentlemen, his blood on the rear gate, with that match that makes him one in 57 billion people that could have left that blood. I mean, there's what? There's 5 billion people on the planet? That means you'd have to go through 57 billion people to find the DNA profile that matches Mr. Simpson's. There's only 5 billion people on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an identification, OK? That proves it's his blood. Nobody else is on the planet. No one. Now, they know that. Now, the blood on the socks, Nicole's blood on the socks. Again, RFLP match, very powerful. Showed from Cellmark, her that was a five probe match, I believe found to be one in 6.8 billion people. Again, more than there are people on the planet, identification. An 11 probe match by DOJ showed that it was one in 7.7 .7 billion people. Again, her blood and only hers on this planet could be on that sock. Now, how do you get around that? It wasn't wrong, and they couldn't find an expert who would say it was contaminated because there's too much DNA. That is the blood. That type is the type. It is her blood. How do you get around that? And if you know that that's true, if you know it's her blood on his socks that they find on, on the morning of June the 13th, that alone, with the rear gate stain, convicts him. You can't believe otherwise. You have so much proof now. How do they get around that? They have to find a theory to get around that. And what do they do? This is what they come up with. So if it's low in volume DNA, it's contaminated. If it's high volume DNA, it's planted, and it's also very convenient and ridiculous. Now, their experts had access to all of the evidence in this case. Their experts could have come in and shown you how the evidence got contaminated. Got contaminated, not possibly. Remember I talked to you about mere possibility? No, did, did get contaminated. And they could have come in here and told you and pointed out the evidence that showed why only the blood drops left by the murderer got contaminated, and shown you why they consistently and only got contaminated in a way that showed the defendant's DNA type. Not that they possibly could have. Yes, possibly we're all sitting on Mars right now, you know, and I'm from Venus and I'm talking, anything's possible. Let's talk about what did happen. Let's talk about what we've got. 
They could have shown you proof that the Bundy blood drops were contaminated, not the mere possibility. No, I'm talking about s evidence that gives you a reason to conclude that that happened and that they never could do. And they could have done it if it were true, but they didn't. And not one expert they brought in on the DNA did even one test on the blood evidence, the evidence that we have that proves to you that the defendant committed these murders, not one. With all those experts you saw. And the reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, is that it isn't true. The blood on the Bundy trail comes back to the defendant because it's his blood. The blood on the rear gate comes back to the defendant because it's blood he left there on the night of the murders. So they took you through all this tortured and twisted road, one moment saying they're, that the police are all a bunch of bumbling idiots, the next moment they're clever conspirators. And now ask yourself, did they ever prove who planted, when, how? And it's a fact that the defense doesn't have to prove anything. That, that's a fact. But once they do decide to put on a case, once they decide to try and prove something, their witnesses are subject to the same scrutiny as the people's witnesses are. Your jury instruction, as I've told you, makes no distinction. It's up to them to do the best job that they can to make their point. And I think a good example of how they failed to do that miserably in this case is the EDTA, that preservative that you find in the purple top tube. They've got to make you believe that blood was planted. It's the cornerstone of their defense. It really is, because as I've pointed out, if you know that's his blood left on the rear gate, if you know that's her blood on his socks, what are you left to conclude? Now, what do they do to show you, to prove to you the cornerstone of their defense? What do they do? They take our tests, our tests, and they have some other expert who neither did the test himself nor could come in and try and interpret those graphs for you. Not only that, but he does it inconsistently. He writes a report, if you recall, he wrote a report in which he said he found one parent ion and one daughter ion, not the full daughter spectrum that would permit identification of EDTA, but the same finding of one parent, parent ion, one daughter ion, that Mr. Mart said he found in his own blood, in his own unpreserved blood, which tends to prove, no, which does prove, that the blood on the rear gate, the blood on the socks, are just like Agent Mart's unpreserved blood, natural blood, not from a, a preservative too. So what did they do with that? Here's what happened. Dr. Readers wrote that report, and he said the blood on the sock, the blood on the gate, one parent ion, one daughter ion. Wrote that report, I believe, on July 17th. A few days after he wrote the report, he found out that Agent Martz had just done the test on his own blood and come up with the same result he got on the sock and the gate. Very, very low noise readings and only two of the three ions he should have found, which leads you to understand that it was unpreserved blood. Well, now he's got to do something about that. He has to answer that contradiction because now what we've got is he can't address this. We have proven conclusively it was not EDTA blood. He's got to do something to make his testimony weave its way around. So he gets up and on the stand for the very first time on this witness stand, he makes a new conclusion. And now he says, I find a peak that shows the second daughter ion on the sock. Dr. Readers, what happened between the time of your report and your testimony? Did you do some tests? No. Did you do some experiments? No. Were there some new graphs? Yes, Agent Martz's blood. Not new graphs on the sock, Agent Martz's blood. He had to change his testimony to encompass evidence that refuted his compl conclusion completely. But what they gave you is somebody who did not one test. With access to all the evidence, he tested nothing. They have the experts to do the test, they did nothing. They have the experts to do experiments to prove things they want to prove about it. Nothing. That's the cornerstone of their defense, ladies and gentlemen. They did nothing. Now, what does that tell you? What that tells you is they know. 
This is not EDTA blood. Saying it's so doesn't make it so. Having a lawyer stand up in front of you and say something, no matter how often it's said, doesn't mean it's true. I include, I include myself in this. You know, I only argue what the facts show, what, what I believe the facts have shown, and any reasonable inferences that you can draw from them. That is all. I cannot stand before you and tell you something that is false, that is untrue. You need to go with what is true, with the evidence, with what we have and the reasonable common sense deductions that you make from that evidence. I don't ask you to take my word for anything. That's why we present on evidence. That's why we call witnesses. If it isn't in the record or it doesn't make sense to you as a logical inference from what you've heard, reject it. I don't care who says it, reject it. But do the same for the defense. Hold me to that standard, hold them to that standard. When you hear them try to tell you that all of this evidence was either contaminated or planted. Ask yourself, does this really make sense? Was it, what evidence was I given to prove that? Is there any evidence that really shows that? Or is it smoke and mirrors? Is it all the smoke to cloud everything, cloud all the issues, distract you? Take a little piece here, take a little piece there. Kind of reminds me of that story about all these guys that are blindfolded and each one goes to a different end of an elephant. One grabs the tail, and he says, feels like, feels like a rope. And the other guy grabs the trunk, and he says, feels like a fire hose. And another guy, guy grabs the leg and said, feels like a tree. Okay? Now, one of them got it right, did they? you Take off the blindfold, it's an elephant. You put all the pieces together, you put the whole picture together, and you can see the truth. But what they have done systematically is fragmented the case. Now, this is not new. You know, I mean, they, they did a very good job of it. They're fine lawyers. And they, they challenge the people's case as they should. And th that's good. You put the state to their proof. That's what we have to do. We have to deliver. That's our job. And we have. But be aware of what's happening here. They're fragmenting. They take little pieces out of context and focus on only that little piece. And take a little piece of a picture, focus on only this little piece of the picture, and forget about all the rest that puts it all in context give Henry Lee second generation photographs that he can't see anything on instead of the good stuff, the original photographs that would show him what's going on on Bundy Walk there. Now, back to DNA, I'm sorry, I digress. Even when it's analyzed using the PCR method, it's not quite so easily contaminated as the defense would have you believe. As you've learned, it's used every day to save lives. And as you've also heard, it's used in very non-sterile conditions. It's used to identify war dead. Now, what does that mean? War dead, soldiers who die in jungles and in deserts, those are not sterile environments, ladies and gentlemen. Those are very dirty environments. But they use PCR testing to identify those soldiers. And why do they do that? So they can notify next of kin. That's a very serious responsibility. You better be right. You better be right. Now, if it's good enough to go and notify next of kin that their son, their daughter, their husband, their father has been murdered or killed, excuse me, on a, on a battlefield, then it better be good and reliable stuff. So if it's good enough for that, on body parts being recovered from jungles and deserts, it's pretty hardy, pretty durable. Now, Dr. Lee, the defense expert they gave none of the DNA evidence to examine, who is a forensic expert, approves of DNA testing in criminal cases. Notice they didn't ask him to look at the evidence here. Notice they didn't ask him to tell what he thought of the results in this case. A forensic expert, a criminal expert. They didn't ask him. Who'd they bring in? Dr. Gerties. Dr. Gerties, who has admittedly no experience in forensic cases, came in to tell us about validation studies and dot blots. But what did he do in this case? What forensic criminal experience does he have? Zip. None. Why do you even use a guy like that in a criminal case when you've got Dr. Lee? And don't forget Dr. Blake. Dr. Blake, who is renowned 
as a scientist who is one of the foremost experts and leading ones in the forensic use of PCR technology, whom they had watching the testing at DOJ, examined the evidence in this case, take, in this case took cuttings of the evidence in this case at Selmark, never sat in that blue chair for the defense. Why not? Where was he? If you have evidence to prove that there is something, that, if, that there is contamination in these samples, you have an expert who is there watching the testing, who is an expert in the field of PCR, does it in criminal cases all the time, he's renowned, you never call him. What sense does that make? What does that tell you about what you've been given here in the nature of the defense? smoke and mirrors, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, when DNA degrades, as you've been told, it doesn't turn into someone else's type. You get no result. And you may remember, no result. I mean, degrades, nothing. You may remember that Dr. Cotton testified. She was asked, well, how, how would a swatch in which DNA is all degraded get contaminated with another person's type? How could that happen? She said, well, really, they've got to be touching. The swatches would have to come in contact. A swatch of somebody else's type would have to come into physical contact with a swatch where the DNA had completely degraded. She could not envision flying DNA as they have tried to sell you in the defense because DNA just doesn't jump or fly. And don't forget, in case you had, we even did prove that their contamination theory was untrue. If you remember, we had a lot of testimony in what we call substrate controls. Now, all the substrate controls are, it's really, you know, I think uh, you'll remember, it's very simple. You go and you collect a blood stain from here, and then, in order to make sure that the blood type you're going to pick up there isn't the result of something underneath that was already there before the blood came down, you take a little swatch right next to it to show that the ground underneath didn't have any DNA. And we did that. That was done at Bundy, next to every blood stain, systematically done. Now, how do, you, how do they help you? When you go to test the swatches, the blood stain swatches and the controls are tested the same way. And if you have contamination, the controls should come up showing DNA. And the controls on the Bundy walk did not. And there you go. <clears throat> oh, I wanted to uh, go over an instruction with you. This is a long instruction that has particular relevance to this case. This is the instruction about circumstantial and direct evidence. There's a lot of words in this instruction, I must say. Um, let me, let me first say something to you about direct and circumstantial evidence. This, this instruction explains them both. I don't know how well. You know, I'm not a big fan of these, the way they're written. I think they could be a lot clearer, frankly. But um, they talk about direct and circumstantial evidence. Um, this one is just circumstantial evidence. You have another instruction that distinguishes between the two. You're told in these instructions that direct and circumstantial evidence are of equal weight. Neither one is better than the other. Now, an example of direct evidence would be an eyewitness someone who would say, I saw him, I saw that. We have an eyewitness in Alan Park, okay? His testimony seeing who we, the man we know to be the defendant walking into the house at Rockingham. Alan Park testified to his observations. That's direct evidence, okay? Circumstantial evidence is evidence that leads you to infer, okay? 
for example, in this, in this case, the blood. The blood at Bundy drip, dripped by the killer next to the bloody shoe prints. It's not direct. Somebody didn't see the murder being committed, didn't see the murderer leaving the scene of the crime, but you have the blood of the murderer left behind. It's kind of like, um, well, and you have the blood on the rear gate. That actually identifies Mr. Simpson. That's kind of like a fingerprint, okay? That's circumstantial evidence as opposed to seeing it. Now, in terms of quality, there's no difference. The law has no favorites. But when you think about it, you think about it logically, circumstantial evidence has a lot of benefits that direct evidence doesn't. What is that? It gives you a lot of quality assurance. It gives you independent corroborating bases on which to believe that the defendant is guilty. Instead of relying on one person's observation, one person who might be mistaken, who might be tired, who might not have observed very well, you know what happens because you saw it happen in this case. What happens with an eyewitness? They start out saying, for example, let, you know, a robbery, okay? I was standing on the street corner and I saw the defendant go over to um, the woman and grab her purse, okay? Purse snatch, okay? Cross-examination. How far away were you from that woman? Where were you standing? Were they standing in shadow? Do you wear glasses? How much of the defendant's face did you see? Half? Three quarters? Only a quarter? What kind of hair did he have? What kind of shirt did he wear? What kind of pants did he wear? What color eyes did he have? Did he have a goatee? Did he have a mustache? Did he have a beard? And so on and so forth. And the witness starts to get torn down. And if that's all you've got, that's all you've got is that person's observation to make you a little unsteady about whether or not you really have enough proof to give you that certainty that you need. Now, contrast that with the following. You have the defendant committing a purse snatch. And what you have is someone who hears the woman scream, sees the back of a man running, and then a few minutes later, the defendant is caught three blocks away holding her purse. Assume for a moment that she cannot really identify her attacker. You got him with her purse just a few minutes later. A lot of things can be said about how it got to him, yeah, but that's circumstantial evidence. But even that circumstantial evidence is not nearly as good. It doesn't come close to what we have in this case. In this case, you have circumstantial evidence of the blood, you have hair and fiber, and you have some of the conduct evidence and the opportunity evidence. You have a wealth of evidence in this case, all pointing to one person, the defendant. Now, this instruction, usually when I see lawyers argue this, they, they, they take out one paragraph and they only talk about that one. I want to talk about the whole instruction here. Okay, begins in the very first paragraph with the fact, a finding of guilt as to any crime may not be based on circumstantial evidence unless the proved circumstances are not only one, consistent with the theory that the defendant is guilty of the crime, but two, cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. You'll see the word reasonable, rational throughout these jury instructions because that's what it's all about. Reason, common sense, logical, rational. All right, now here's, I'm going to uh, jump around between this and I'm going to come back and forth to this instruction because there's a lot here. But in the third paragraph, this is what I told you about a little bit earlier. If you have two reasonable interpretations, remember I talked to you about, I gave you the example of the Bronco that could have been on Ashford or could have been gone completely at the time that Charles Kale was walking his dog. You had two reasonable interpretations from that evidence when he said he couldn't see the Bronco on Rockingham. At the point in time that he testified, based on his testimony, you had two reasonable conclusions to draw either that it was not there at all or that it was on Ashford and he didn't see it. When you have two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to guilt and the other to innocence, you adopt the interpretation that points to the innocence and reject that, re that interpretation which points to his guilt. That is when they are <coughs> equally susceptible of two reasonable interpretations. 
if, on the other hand, one interpretation of the evidence appears to you to be reasonable and the other to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. Reasonable, rational. The defense will argue to you many things, inferences that could be drawn, just like the possibilities I talked to you about. Ask yourself, are they reasonable? Because if they are not, if those inferences are not reasonable, then you are to reject them and accept the reasonable. And that's why I keep referring to common sense, rational, logical. All right, I'd like to start with hair and fiber. If you remember, Mr. Diedrich uh, testified about the microscopic comparisons of hair and fiber in this case. And when, now when he did so, well, first, let me point something out. His testimony was uncontradicted by any other expert. His testimony is not disputed. His conclusions are not disputed. And you know that the hair and fiber evidence was examined by at least two other experts for the defense. Now, when Mr. Diedrich testified, he told you what his conclusions were based solely on what he could see through the microscope. That's all he can tell you about. He did not take into account the results of the DNA testing. He didn't take into account the testimony of Cato or of Alan Park, none of that. He looks through a microscope. So all he can tell you is that the defendant's hair shares the same microscopic characteristics as, for example, the, ha the hair in the knit cap found in Bundy or the hair found on Ron Goldman's shirt. He can only say it's consistent, shares the same microscopic characteristics. But when you take into account all of the evidence, including the DNA, including the testimony of Cato and Park, including the defendant's opportunity to commit the murders, including his post-homicidal conduct, you know it's his hair. You know it's that fiber. So now we are going to put it all together. So when I talk to you now about that, the defendant's hair in the cap, I'm talking about not just Doug Deidre's testimony. I'm talking about his testimony along with everything else, all the reasonable inferences that you can draw, all the logical conclusions that you come to, knowing all that we know in this case. Now, I'm not going to talk about every conclusion that Mr. Diedrich testified to. Some of them were only testified to to give you more information, more background, more knowledge about what you expect to find in this testimony. So let's start. What I'd like to do is start with the bodies at Bundy uh, and move away from them as the defendant moved away from them after the murders and analyze all of the evidence that was left behind from that perspective. And just so you know, I will show you a couple of photographs from the crime scene, but I'm not going to put up any coroner's pictures. Uh, I've seen enough of that for a while. So when I describe the uh, wounds from the coroner and that sort of thing, I'm just going to describe them. You're not going to see pictures from me. You can see them back in the jury room if you like. All right, let's start with the knit cap. Um, can we get the Bundy board? Um, with the knit cap, I think we have to cut the feed. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bancroft, this has uh, remains on it. You're not going to get it back in the jury room. This is just for me to talk to you and show you stuff with.
All right, 2.30, can you see it now? All right, the knit cap. You can barely see it under the plant here. This is a position in which it was found. Now you can see how the defendant could miss it in the dark. It's underneath that plant. I'm pointing to it right here, that blue, patch of blue here. On that knit cap, you recall that the, uh, well, it's the defendant's hairs. Now let me refer specifically to Mr. Diedrich's testimony in this regard, because what he told us is this. He said there were hair, the hairs that he said were consistent with the defendants. Uh, he found nine inside the cap. And it's clear, extrapolating from his testimony, it's clear that nine, they were nine, I think, naturally shed hairs is what he said. Not fragments, but naturally shed hairs. That he wore the cap from that. Now, What's interesting also is that he talked about fragments that were found inside the cap, hairs of black origin that were not consistent with Mr. Simpson's. And so I asked him, you know, what, what about those hairs? Well, he said they were treated, chemically treated. How long were they in the cap? Can't tell. They could have been there for years. Because you can, you know, life experience, if you ever had anything knit like that, kind of a loose weave, and you'll have it in evidence, you can check it out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get hairs in it, and those hairs could stay there for a very long time if it's not washed. It's not laundered. So that's why I asked the defendant's hairdresser, could it have, what, did, what about the defendant's former wife, Marguerite? Did she treat her hair? What about Arnell? Did she treat her hair? These are other possible people that could have worn the cap and whose hair could, the fragments, old fragments, could be from. But the nine naturally shed hairs inside the cap that were consistent with the defendant's were different in quality than those because they were not fragments and therefore unlikely to be old. All right, and taking into account everything that we know, those were his hairs in the cap. He wore the cap. He also found on that cap fiber, and he said it was consistent with the defendant's, the carpet from the defendant's bronco. And he talked to you about the unusual uh, nature of the, it, the trilobal um, cross-section of that fiber. And he showed you photographs of it through this, that were taken from the scanning electron microscope. You'll have that back in the jury room if you want to see it. It's very interesting stuff. But what we know, from all we know, that was a fiber from the defendant's bronco on that cap. Now that's very important because that actually, with that cap, we have tied the defendant and his car to the crime scene at Bundy. And now you see, to summarize, on the knit cap, we have the defendant's hair and the bronco fiber from the carpet in his bronco. And another piece of the puzzle. Now let's go to Ron's shirt. Now on Mr. Goldman's shirt, we have the defendant's hair and we have the blue-black cotton fiber. Now, of course, the defendant's hair is of obvious significance. Mr. Diedrich was asked whether or not that hair appeared to be, the hair that he said was consistent with the defendant's, whether it appeared soiled. He said no. That was very important, and that was very important for this reason. If we had simply found hairs of the defendant in the soil of that area in Bundy where Ron Goldman was lying, we probably would not think that was a big deal. Why? He visited the place. He was there, pick up the children, leave the children, and that there might be stray hairs lying around in the soil, uh, you know, falling from whatever reason. This would not be very significant. I wouldn't be standing here talking to you about it right now but you have an unsoiled hair on the victim's shirt, that's important. And that makes the distinction. Because if it had been something he picked up from the soil, then you should have seen dirt in it. 
The fact that it was unsoiled means it was the result of contact between the defendant and Ronald Goldman that night during the murders. We certainly have no reason at all to believe there was any contact between the defendant and Ronald Goldman before the murders committed. We have something else on Ron's shirt. We have the blue-black cotton fibers. All right, so what's the big deal about that? Well, you recall that Mr. Diedrich found blue-black cotton fibers in two other places. And the blue-black cotton fibers that he found that shared the same microscopic characteristics as those he found on Ron <coughs> Goldman's shirt were found on the Rockingham glove and on the defendant's socks. So what could that be? Well, clearly, those are fibers from what the defendant was wearing that night. You recall what Cato described. He was wearing the dark blue to black cotton sweatsuit with long sleeves. Now, a sweatsuit has banded ankles and is going to be in contact with your socks. Obviously, too, a sweatsuit, you know, if you have those, if you have an elastic ankle, exertion, you're going to pull the pants up. It's going to rub. There's going to be some friction there. And it's natural, of course, it's all, also common sense, that you will find fiber from one piece of clothing transferred to another, which is why, if you recall, when he was testifying, I asked him, did you find any of Ron Goldman's shirt fibers on his jeans? Yeah, I did. Not a surprising thing, very common. Same thing happened with the defendant. And when he had contact with Ronald Goldman, when he attacked Ronald Goldman, he left fibers from what he was wearing on Ron Goldman's shirt. And when he went to take, and in wearing that sweatsuit over those socks, he left fibers on those socks. And in having maybe the Rockingham glove in his pocket, when he was running down the south pathway, picking up fibers from it, from, that, from his clothing, when the glove fell out, it still had the fiber from his clothing. And that's why you have those fibers sharing the same microscopic characteristics with all the tests he performed on them, there were quite a few, in those three places, going to the crime scene, the south pathway, and the defendant's bedroom. So with this piece of evidence, we have again, we've tied the defendant to the murders, and this link carries us from Bundy clear into the defendant's bedroom in Rockingham. And here's a summary of what we've just discussed, the defendant's hair on Ron Goldman's shirt and blue-black cotton fibers. Yeah. And another piece of the puzzle. All right, now let's move away from Ron and start up the walkway. direct your attention to the board. The bloody shoe prints. Now the bloody shoe prints actually start down here. I'll just hold it up for a minute. On this very first photograph on the bottom, you can see the shoe print right next to the blue knit cap. It starts between And those bloody shoe prints go all the way down the walkway till you get to about halfway when they fade out. This is another important piece of evidence that proves the defendant's guilt. The shoe prints are all size 12. The shoe prints were all, <clears throat> and by the way, size 12, less than 10% of the male population wears that size. And the men who wear that size tend to fall within the height range of 5'11 to 6'4. The defendant is 6'2. And these are not just any size 12s. They're expensive shoes. Casual shoes that cost 160 bucks. Not dress shoes. Shoes that would be worn by a rich man. The kind of man who would wear cashmere-lined gloves. 
And what's even more important is that those shoes were only sold in 40 stores in this country. Out of how many thousands, maybe even millions of stores in this country, these shoes are only sold in 40 of them. And one of those 40 stores was Bloomingdale's, the store the defendant shopped in regularly, where he would buy shoes, both dress and casual, as you heard the testimony. They stopped selling those shoes back in 1992. But during the time that they sold them, the defendant was shopping at Bloomingdale's. Now, as we move down the walkway, we see that there's only one set of bloody shoe prints. Mr. Bozziak, I think, made that very clear, especially on his last visit. Only one set of the imprints were bloody shoe prints. And all of them were consistently Bruno Mali, size 12. And there's the summary. Defendant's shoe, shoe size is 12, less than 10% of the population. Expensive, rare men's shoes sold at very few stores. And another piece of the puzzle. Now we look to the left of the bloody shoe prints, and we see the blood drops on the walkway. These are the blood drops left by the murderer. I've already talked to you about that. And it's clear, because they go all the way <coughs> alongside to the left of the bloody shoe prints down that walkway. Five blood drops, all of which match the defendant. Now, of the four inside the gate, four on the walkway that is inside the gate, all four were done with PCR. One was also done with conventional serology. You recall there was testimony about that from Greg Matheson. But all of them match the defendant. As we get to the rear gate, we see that there's more blood. And this blood also matches the defendant. Now, on the rear gate, I think I've already talked to you about that, the, def the blood that matches the defendant was typed to one in 57 billion. In other words, that's identity. That is his blood. And then we go out to the driveway, and you recall blood drop number 52. And that drop was also done with RFLP. And in that blood drop out on the driveway, you have the uh, typing, I think, determined with RFLP was that it was 1 in 170 million. The reason for the lower number is because they had fewer probes. It was a weaker sample. The reason for that, I'll talk about that for a minute, you have a different environment. And I think it's important to note, on the walkway, we don't have a good picture of it here. There are other pictures that you have in evidence that'll show this. The walkway is very dirty, and it's concrete. It's porous. It absorbs. On the other hand, on the gate, you have a smooth surface. It's up off the ground, and it's not as much in contact with dirt and with the elements, and it's not going to be absorbed in the gate because you have the paint on the gate that prevents it from doing that which is why you have higher molecular weight DNA. The more that DNA is subjected to bacteria, to dirt that degrades it, the more it's going to degrade, the less DNA you're going to have. The dirtier the environment, the less the DNA. The cleaner, more, less hostile environment, the more DNA, very simple. So you have more DNA on the gate than you do on a dirty walkway. The gate is not the cleanest thing in the world, I guarantee, but you do have it's up off the ground. You do have a non-absorbent surface. So th that's part of the reason for the uh, higher weight DNA. The other part of the reason is that the rear gate, by inference from all of the testimony, that stain was collected and taken down right away instead of sitting in plastic bags in a hot truck. All right. So you have all of the blood on the walkway matching the defendant. You have RFLP results on the rear gate that identifies the defendant. You have a, a drop on the uh, driveway, one in 170 million. That's a virtual identification of the defendant under all of these circumstances as well. And another piece of the puzzle. 
Now let's talk about the Bronco. Escobar, would you just show that briefly to council, please? All right, thank you. All right, first of all, just consider the fact that there's blood in the Bronco at all. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, do you have blood on the interior driver's door of your car, on the dashboard, on the console? I mean, think about that. And all at the same time. As for the amount of blood in the car, how much would you expect to see? When you think about it, the defendant inflicted the wounds that bled out on these victims, the, the ones that really uh, bled out, from behind them, the, the throat cut that was demonstrated to you by Dr. Lakshmanan. So if he's standing behind them, they're bleeding out this way, how much blood is he going to get on them? Not very much. And he certainly wouldn't be getting any on his back which is where he's going to be in contact with the seat. It's his back and the back of his legs. No. Then he blood it all on his hands from touching. So the blood that you see in the Bronco is actually, logically speaking, where you'd expect to see it from a cut hand or from a bloody glove that's dropped down next to the console. It's the amount you'd expect to see. It's where you'd expect to see it, given the circumstances of this case. <clears throat> now let's talk about the cut finger. Look at where we found blood on the door. You found blood inside the well of the driver's door handle. And you found some closer to the driver's window. This blood in here, in the well of the driver's door handle inside this car, how do you get that blood there? Think about where you'd have to put your hand. Think about where you'd have to be sitting when you put your hand there. When you get out of the car, if you're seated in the car, in the driver's seat, and you need to open the door to get out, that's what you do. You put your hand in the door handle to open it in a seated position. So that blood got on there after he went, when he drove back from Bundy with a bloody finger to get out of his car, that's the only position you could be in to get the blood in the well of that door handle like that. Because to get it there, you're opening the door. And to be opening the door from inside the car, you'd be seated in the car. So now we know yet another fact that shows that he was bleeding in that car long before he went out to get his cell phone from the Bronco to leave for the airport. Now, the defense is not claiming that the defendant's blood in the Bronco was either planted or contaminated. They concede that one right up front. And that's because they can come up with an explanation for that one. Remember the razor sharp cell phone. But remember, it's only the evidence that they can't otherwise explain that they resort to the desperation theories of contamination and planting. But it's not only the defendant's blood in this car. There's also the blood of Ron and Nicole in that Bronco. And there are other people who saw that there was blood in that car at Rockingham in the early morning hours of June the 13th. Recall another witness called by the defense, Officer Don Thompson, who was guarding the car and kind of taking care of business at Rockingham. He saw the blood in the Bronco as well. Now, you may remember that the blood on the console was initially collected. By the console, I mean the area here marked by the number 31. This number tag is in between the seats. Testimony was that Dennis Fung collected blood from that console on June the 14th at the print shed. That was before it went to Vertel's, that uh, tow yard where it seems that like everybody and his brother went to look at that car. 
before it went there, Dennis Fung collected that blood. Now, the results of the blood collected by Dennis Fung on, in the morning of June the 14th indicated with PCR testing the presence of blood from the defendant and from Ronald Goldman. And it indicated that the response for the, it was mostly the defendant's blood in that mixture. Now, you heard all the testimony about the insecure conditions at Bertel's and uh, how the car was kept unlocked because they didn't have a key for it. And you may remember that the defendant had to be, that the uh, Bronco had to be towed from Rockingham because early in the morning when the uh, police had contacted the defendant, if you may recall, Cato testified that the detectives asked him for a key to the Bronco because it was locked, they couldn't get inside it, and he couldn't find a key. And you may also recall that there was testimony indicating that the car had to be towed because it couldn't be unlocked. They didn't unlock it until the 14th when they had to do that with a Slim Jim. Basically had to break into it. <clears throat> well, after the Bronco left for Tells, I think it was about a month later, it went to a more secure location. And at the request of the defense, an examination of the Bronco was conducted in their presence. And Michelle Kessler told you of how she saw that Dennis Fung had not collected all of the blood off the console. And she said, let's collect the rest of it. So they took the console out. And Greg Matheson actually swatched the remaining blood off the console in the presence of the defense experts. And that was on, I believe, August 26th, either August 26th or September 1st. Now, that blood that he swatched on either August 26th or September 1st, in the presence of the defense, did not go through LAPD testing at all. That blood went straight up to the Department of Justice for testing. And it came back with an RFLP match that you heard late in the trial. RFLP meaning we had more DNA in it. And we were able to say, we were able to match the blood again to the defendant and Ron Goldman. That's very important for two reasons. Number one, it shows you that it is not so easy to contaminate DNA. It's not so easy to contaminate blood. Even though that console sat there in the Bronco at Vertel's, where everybody had to go and check this Bronco out, the results that were obtained on the morning of the 14th before it went to Vertel's are the same as the results that were obtained about two months later, two and a half months later. So it tells you also that PCR testing is accurate. But of course, even more importantly, it tells you that Ron Goldman's blood is in that Bronco. And there's no reason for his blood to be in that Bronco, an RFLP match, unless the defendant committed the murders and had the blood of Ron Goldman on him to swipe on that Bronco. Now, there's something else about that Bronco that I wanted to point out to you. Can we put the photo up? For this, I think it's better to show you the picture up on the screen. <coughs> this, which one is this, John? All right, this is the photo the of the Bronco uh, driver's side mm -hmm. yes, Your Honor. floorboard. All right, Ms. Clark, proceed, and we'll have Mr. Farrell tell us which one this is. here a little bit. I showed you a photograph of this during the trial that I think was a lot clearer than what you're seeing now. <clears throat> this one's very faded. Okay, we're going to get a clearer picture for you. What I'm going to point out to you, though, ladies and gentlemen, is the bloody imprint that was in the driver on the driver's side of that carpet. On the driver's side of the floor mat, where a driver would put his foot, we find a bloody imprint. A bloody imprint that 
Mr. Boziak told you had characteristics consistent with the Bruno Mali shoe of that S pattern that he talked about and a bloody imprint that was tested and matched to the blood of Nicole Brown. That carpet piece was cut out of the Bronco by Dennis Fung on June the 14th at the print shed. Now, think about this one for a minute, because just the fact of having blood in that location tells you something. How in the world do you get blood on the floor mat in a position where a driver puts his foot unless you have stepped in blood and then sat in the car and put your foot on that spot? How else? How else? How many times have you stepped in blood and how many times have you tracked it into your car? I don't know how many, but you can see just logically somebody who is walking around with bloody shoes gets in to drive his car and the carpet comes up. There you go. And this is People's? It's on People's 172. People's 172, thank you. Thank you. Ask Jonathan to point it to you. It's you can probably see it though. Do you want to use the laser? Oh great. This is easier. Look. See right here? And that's what we had testimony about with respect to the blood testing and with respect to Mr. Boziak. But when I sat and I listened to that, I thought, gee, I I don't know how how much clearer it could be. I really don't. You have, the blood, you have the bloody shoe prints going down the walkway, understandably on concrete, a hard surface, they fade out. Then you put that same bloody shoe that obviously got blood up in the uh, grooves of the pattern of the shoe onto a soft surface like a carpet that picks up that blood, whatever's remaining. How else did it get there? And those bloody shoe prints that lead away from the bodies of Ron and Nicole reach right into the defendant's bronco. All right, we have, you can, you can already see, we have such a wealth of evidence that we could probably stop right here, but Frankly, I'd like to, but I have to finish going through all of the evidence. And the Bronco went back to Rockingham. So let's go back to Rockingham as we trace the steps. And I'll quickly review the evidence for you at Rockingham. All right, so he gets in the Bronco and he drives back to Rockingham, parking it on Rockingham, just north of the Rockingham Gate, where we see it in all of the photographs. Now, as I've described earlier, the defendant runs down the south pathway. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, why? Why would he do that? And I talked to you about disposing of the knife really common. Murderers want to get rid of the murder weapon. They think that's the one thing that can nail them. He's running back to that rear lot. The re he never gets there because he crashes into the air conditioner, dropping the glove. Why would he need to put the knife on his own property? You're thinking, why not drop it in a dumpster on the way home? <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Why not? Why would you want to do that? Leave it on your own property or bury it on your own property? He can't. He can't because he's famous. If someone sees him hanging around near a dumpster on that night of all nights 
at that time of all times, dropping something into a dumpster, they're going to recognize him. And he's going to have a witness. A witness who's going to put him very close to the scene of the crime at the very wrongest time he could be there, right after the murders. He can't dispose of evidence in public. Every move he makes is noticed. So he's got to find a private place. And that's the one that makes the most sense. And he doesn't have a whole lot of time to be, get real creative here. So what do we find on the Rockingham glove, the one he dropped? We find everything. Everything. We find fibers consistent with Ron Goldman's shirt. We find the hair of Ron. We find the hair of Nicole. We find the blood of Ron Goldman. We find the blood of Nicole Brown. And we find the blood of the defendant. And we find bronco fiber from the defendant's bronco. We find blue-black cotton fibers just like those found on the shirt of Ron Goldman and on the socks of the defendant in his bedroom. And on this glo glove, he is tied to every aspect of the murder, to Ron Goldman, to Nicole Brown, to the car. And of course, that's why the defense has to say that the glove is planted. Because if they don't, everything about this glove convicts the defendant. Where it's found, what's found on it, what's found in it, even a black limb hair found inside the glove. Everything about it convicts him. Even though the planting theory is ridiculous, when you think about it, you give it a little rational thought and you realize it's absurd. Whatever you think of Mark Furman, nobody thinks much of him. He couldn't have done this. Why couldn't he have done this? It's not just the fact that all the other officers who were there before him saw only one glove. Think about what he knew at the time he went out to the South Pathway. He didn't know whether or not there were eyewitnesses to the crime that would say somebody else did it. He didn't know if there was going to be someone who said, I heard voices. They weren't his. They weren't Mr. Simpson's. He didn't know if the defendant had an airtight alibi and had maybe left on the 9 o'clock flight to Chicago. He didn't know any of that. He could have, what he could have done by planting evidence has been wrong. And, and completely fouled up the, the solution of a case. Because he's doing something like that without knowing anything about the case. Subjecting himself, himself, think about his own self-preservation, to incredible, an, 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 an incredible uh, felony. He's in big trouble, in big trouble. And all that has to happen is that an alibi is proven or an eyewitness comes forward, neither one of which he knows anything about. They could be out there for all he knows. They, he probably thinks they are. So think about that when you consider this theory of the defense. You know, I mean, it, it's like dismissing logic and reality and reason all at once. Throw them out the window. Because nothing makes sense about that theory. Nothing from even Mark Furman's point of view. But I think if you look clearly at the evidence, if you look straight on and you use your common sense, you're going to see this. You're going to know this. You will. But the bottom line is, and I think that you'll reach the same conclusion, no one planted that glove. You know why? Because they're his gloves. They're his gloves. Think about all the evidence you've heard now. Remember that he's a size extra large. The gloves are a size extra large. The glove at Rockingham is a mate to the glove at Bundy. They're a pair. A pair that are the same exact type purchased by Nicole on December 18th, 1990. One of only 200 pairs sold that year. Gloves that are cashmere lined. Gloves that cost $55. 
rich man's gloves. Gloves that were exclusive to Bloomingdale's. Gloves that were not sold west of Chicago. Gloves that the defendant was wearing at football games from January of 1991, just a few weeks after he, she bought them, until the last football season before the murders. Now, you'll recall that there was a photograph that was shown to you. <clears throat> First of all, the receipt. There was a receipt that was shown to you that showed that when she bought the gloves, she bought two pair of gloves and a muffler on December 18th of 1990. And there was a photograph shown to you during one of the football games that I'm trying to remember the date of. I think it was 92. I think it was 92. In which he's wearing a brown jacket, a brown muffler, and the brown gloves. Doesn't it make sense that when she bought the muffler, she bought it to match at least one of the pair of the gloves? And there he is wearing it. After he, she bought them, until the last football season before the murders. Now, you'll recall that there was a photograph that was shown to you. <clears throat> First of all, the receipt. There was a receipt that was shown to you that showed that when she bought the gloves, she bought two pair of gloves and a 